Welcome everyone to a special Halloween edition of Building with Ben. Today we'll be building a card matching game where we'll be building it using View 3 and the Composition API. Ready for a spooky coding session? It's gonna be a lot of fun. Let's jump right in. So to get started, what we're going to do is we're going to check out our peak of view folder where inside here, what you'll see is that there's not much in it. Uh, there's just a readme.md file and a design folder that contains the various assets that we'll be using uh, once we want to skin the game and make it basically look great uh, for users when they're playing with it. But until then, we'll be building all of the functionality and styles from the ground up. So this will be a lot of fun. So to get started, let's go ahead and uh, check the environment variables so you know what I'm working on in case you want to follow along. So the first thing is that I'm on Node version 12.19.0, which is the latest stable version of Node.js. And I'm also using, let's see, I'm using, ver uh, for the Vue CLI, I'm using version 4.5.8. So this will be our starting point for this app. All right. Next, what we're going to go ahead and do is scaffold our view three project by using the view, the view CLI command view create, and we'll add a period to basically say, we want to create it inside of this folder. So generate in the current directory, we want to say yes. And we'll go ahead and select the default view three preview. So I'm going to hit that, and let it install. All right. With everything scaffolded, let's go ahead and check out our project. We can see in here now that Vue CLI has gone ahead and created our source and public, uh, basically what you expect from the Vue CLI scaffold. Um, so let's go ahead and commit that so we can track those changes. So I'm gonna add everything here. And we'll say this was a config where we initialize UCLI v3 project. Okay, great. All right, with that, let's go ahead and start our local server with yarn serve. You can also run npm run serve if you're not using yarn. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and open our localhost 8080 and boom, perfect. We have everything on the right hand side. Switching over to VS Code, we have a bit of boilerplate here, so let's go ahead and knock those things out. Uh, oh, whoops, 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 that's gone. That's gone. Delete the components. Great. And we're just gonna say uh, peak of view. And then with that saved, that correctly. We can delete this boilerplate component, and we don't need this view local asset. All right, wonderful. So with that cleaned up, we can go ahead and let me open a new tab here. All right. So we've wiped out. So this is uh, this is chore. So we're gonna go ahead and remove boilerplate files. All right, wonderful. Okay. So with that, let's jump back over to our terminal. So now that we have this here, the first thing we want to do for our game is we want to actually be able to show, like, basically we want to show cards um, on the board. And so for this game, we're doing a four by four game. So we want to show 16 cards in total. So the way we're going to do that, let's go ahead and start by uh, creating our div. So let's see. So this will be a section on the page and I'll call it game board. That's what we're going to call it. And we're going to have 16 cards. So let's go ahead and give this a class of card. And using Emmet, we're going to create 16 of these and just save them. So right now, nothing's appearing and that's fine. And so inside of our style block, let's go ahead and let's see if we can go ahead. Uh, I will leave these styles alone. But then for our card, let's just give it a border of 5px solid light gray. And let's just, uh, I think that's actually good enough. So we don't have to worry about the card uh, basically looking like a mess because what we're going to do is on our game board, we're going to use CSS grid in order to define how we want everything to look. Uh, and so as far as the spacing and everything goes, we'll use the grid template columns as the base and we want four by four, right? So we want four columns and let's just, uh, let's go with hundred pixels. So as you can see here, I'll, what, by defining four 100 pixel values, this will envision this is going to be the column. So we can actually, we can just save this here and you already see that something's starting to happen, but it's, it's again, it's hard to tell. So let's go ahead and add the uh, grid gap column and I'll just give 30 pixels between them. I think this should, Ooh, looks like I grid, oh, it should be grid column gap, I believe. So grid column gap, and when I save, ah, so you see now, the four columns are starting to appear as we expect. 
So since we have grid template columns, it would be safe to assume then that we have rows. And so we want 100 pixels for each row and we want the grid column, or sorry, grid row gap to be 30 pixels as well. So hey, look at that. Already our um, divs are looking much better. Let's go ahead and center that on the page though. And so what we can do is we can use the justify content uh, center on this one. And then we can see already now we have a basic game board on uh, our app. So what we're going to go ahead and do is let's go ahead and just uh, let's commit that right now. So uh, create game board scaffold. All right. All right. So now that we have our game board rendered, the next part we're going to want to check out is the card. After all, we have 16 of the divs here and on the page, and frankly, that's just not a way to manage um, our components. Clearly, there is a chance for refactoring here. So what we're going to go ahead and do is create a card component um, that we'll use to basically manage everything inside of the card. So what we can imagine here is that we'll have the div card, and just to make sure everything's showing up, I'll go ahead and have the text card in here. And so inside of our app, let's go ahead and import card from components card. And let's go ahead and register that. And so now, as you can see here, if we go ahead and drop our single card on the page, we have our card showing up as expected. But we need 16 of them. So let's go ahead and create uh, just an array with 16 uh, items in it. So typically what you might do uh, if you're using the object API at this point is to create our data function, which would return our array. But since the whole purpose of this exercise is to practice with the composition API, we will not be doing that and instead be using the setup method. So what we can do here is we have a const, let's say called card list, which will be an array. And we're gonna wanna go ahead and programmatically generate what's inside of those cards. So in this case, let's go ahead and if I run a for loop, you know, let i equal zero and i is less than 16. Let's increment it. So this should create 16 items. Card list will push the value of i onto here and then we'll return card list. And so what's important to understand here is that when you're inside of setup, everything is vanilla JavaScript, one big, one big JavaScript file. The main difference here is that you have to make sure you return what you want to expose to the component. So in this case, we have our card here. So if we loop through the card in card list, right? Uh, and then, so what we need to do is we need to push uh, the value, right? The value right here, we need to pass it down so we can actually see that it's working. So it hasn't been determined yet. So let's go ahead and add the value prop here. So the value prop is gonna take card here and that's all it's gonna be. So this, uh, it's yelling at me because I need a key. So let's go ahead and actually fix that real quick. Um, so when I don't have a unique identifier, usually what I like to do is create a custom string, basically. Well, I'll prepend it with something that's more or less unique to the page or the application that I'm familiar with. And then I'll use the index, which we're going to go ahead and need to break out of the for loop like you would expect in standard JavaScript. And so we can see our cards are rendering, but we need to define our prop of value here. So value, uh, in this case, we know that it's a number, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. And required is true. And to show that it actually is appearing as expected, we'll go ahead and print it out to the screen. And so there, as you can see, we have all we have all of our numbers showing up on our cards as expected. All right. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and commit that. Refactor, um, create card component with value prop. All right. Okay, now that we have our cards, since this game is about being able to match cards, we need to be able to actually show whether or not there's a front and a back to the card. And right now, all we're doing is showing the value directly. So this won't be very challenging as far as pick people picking uh, basically which cards to match. And so what we need then is inside of our card, we need two different divs. Uh, we're gonna need to have a div for the front so this will be, let's give it a say card face and we will put the value in here if this is the front of the card. And so we'll define that with a uh, basically a state, a CSS state class saying that is the front. 
And then we'll have a card face where it is the back. And so just to make sure everything's showing up as we expect, we can see here that, hey, okay, so we see the card in the back, this is good. But what we need to do is style it in a way that actually shows what is happening, right? So in this case, what we're gonna do is let's go ahead and copy over the, the card styles from app.view so we keep everything scoped as expected. And so we're gonna go ahead and let's see. So we know that if it's a card face uh, is front. So I think the key thing for here is let's make it a distinguishable color. So let's just say it's uh, gonna be red and color white. And then we know that if it's the back, we're gonna let's just say background color blue and the color will also be white. And so we can see, okay, it's starting to shape up a little bit, but again, the card face has to be cover the entire thing, right? So what we want then is card face, which will share both, um, you know, these are gonna be shared styles. We want the width and height to be 100%. Okay, so this is good, but what we really need, um, as you can see, is that the cards are now just like stacking on top of each other, but we want them to overlap and to basically sit on each other. So what we're going to need to do is then do um, a position absolute on them. And whoa, that is crazy. And then we'll do top zero. And so that helps a little bit, but really, um, actually, I realized the top actually probably isn't even doing much. Uh, the problem is, is that when we do an absolute positioning with CSS, you need something to it for it to be relative to. And right now, clearly it's being relative to like this big div on the graph, which is probably the board game itself. So we're going to tell it to have position relative on the individual cards. And so as you can see, once it does that, everything snaps according to place, which is great. And so now we have, at least we think we have a front and the back. So the best way to tell this then is let's go ahead and quickly define, uh, basically uh, let's do a VF and then we'll say visible and then otherwise v else we won't show anything so to quickly show that it works uh, let's quickly open up our setup method and we'll define a const called visible and i'll say true for at first and then we'll return visible so just to make sure everything's working correctly so whoops i can't spell visible okay great and so we can see here that when visible is true there you go. When visible is true, everything is showing up. But if we go ahead and say this is false, now it goes back to the back. So this is a good start. Um, but what we need to do, we, what we want to be able to do is actually let the user toggle whether or not it's showing back and forth. And so the best way for us to do this, we could do this a couple of ways. Um, but what we need to do is actually track the visibility of the cart at a larger scale. So I'm going to approach this from a props method um, rather than defining like an internal visible state. Uh, we'll see why in a little bit. And so, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and delete this right now. And we're going to go ahead and get a prop and we're going to define that as visible. And the type is a Boolean with a default of false. So as we save this, as expected, we expect everything to be uh, basically to be showing the back since we're in this else case. Now, back inside of our app.view, we need to actually go ahead and define this. So rather than just simply pushing the number now, what we need to do is actually push an object. And so in this case, we know the value that should be i. And so in this case, we want visible to be false. And so this is actually what we want to be showing. Uh, we want to be pushing into our, uh, our card. So we have our value here, and we have whether or not it's visible, which is now card.visible. And then we have our card.value like this. So if we save this right now, everything looks pretty much the same. Um, and then so we can check this. If we check this is true, everything switches. So, okay, not too bad so far. This is good. Um, but what we need to do now is to be able to actually track whether or not something's visible. Yes, okay. So the way we're going to do this now is we're going to go ahead and emit the event. So we want to know when this is being clicked, right? So we say a click, we'll say, uh, so what will happen is say select card. This is the method that's going to be queued. And so once again, let's go ahead and set up our setup method. And we're doing a select card, and this is going to be a function. And what we want to do is be able to emit an event up to the parent to say, hey, look, you've selected this card. And so the way we do that is inside of setup method, we are given two arguments. We're given the props and the context. 
And so inside of context, we're actually going to be uh, given the ability to emit. That is one of the three properties that context has. So what you'll see here is that if I do context.emit, I can then just like a, a standard emit function, we can emit a, an event. So in this case, I'm going to say select card. And then we can pass it a payload, which I'll go ahead and define as an object. And so the value that uh, is basically that's pass is going to be in this case, actually, no, we don't want value. Why? Because what we're going to need to do is we actually need to find out the position inside of the list. And so this means actually that we're going to have a, another prop that we need. So let me go ahead and just add a position. This will type number and required. Yes, this is much required. And so what we're going to do is we're going to tell it which position, like basically which card was selected. Um, because again, if they're matching, the value won't be a good way to, to tell this because there's going to be two cards in the array that match. So we need to actually tell it what position it's actually in. So in this case, um, eventually it's going to be props.position. Uh, this is going to yell at me later, but we'll deal with that later. And then uh, we want to define whether or not, uh, actually, once the card's been selected, that might be all we need, actually. We just need the position for now. Save. OK, select a card is assigned value, but it's never returned. Yes, good. Thank you for reminding me. So as we can see here, as I mentioned before, we need to actually expose this back into the component, which is great. And so here inside our app.view now, we can listen for the event here by, uh, I believe I said select card. Yeah, select card. That's what I called it. OK, select card. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to call the method called flip card. And let's just call it that for now. So when it, this emit, uh, this event is emitted, we're going to go ahead and call this method. And so inside of our setup function, we're going to define a new function called flip card. And so const flip card is going to be a function. And what it's going to do, it's going to go inside of card list and it's going to go ahead and Actually, we're going to go in, we're going to look for the specific position. And so since this is an event, we're going to be getting a payload, right? That's what we know from define in here. This is what we're passing in. So when you're working with, in case you haven't worked with view events before, this is what we basically a default uh, argument that's passed similar to when you're working with events. So here is the payload. And so we should be able to take payload.position. And then we're going to go ahead and say that now it is true. Uh, sorry, position dot visible. That's what we want. OK, so again, we need to go ahead and make sure we return this and flip card. All right. So now if we click, nothing's happening. This is interesting. Why is that? Well, that's because this entire time we've been working with uh, basically under the assumption at least some of you may have that we're working with reactive values, but we're not. And that's because, like I mentioned before, everything in here is just regular JavaScript. So what we need to do is actually import a helper method called ref from the view package. And this is what allows us to manually define whether or not something's reactive or not. So in this case, we can go ahead and wrap our array with the ref. And then you can see now that when we go ahead and make something reactive, because Vue is using a proxy in order to determine how basically how to track reactivity, what we need to do now is for card list, we need to unpackage it in order to basically work with it. So here it needs to be dot value. And here we need it to be also dot value. Oop. All right. So now when we save, we'll see that everything broke. Let's see why it's yelling at us. Uh, next sibling dot null. Uh, do, 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 card list dot value dot push. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, let's, oh, here we go. I just needed a full refresh. Okay, great. All right, so now when we click, nothing's happening. Visible of undefined, right? Card dot, card list dot value, payload position. Ah, yes, we haven't even defined the position yet. Silly me. So in order to define the position, we just pass in the index. That's what we have. Here we go. So now we save here and then do, 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 do. So position, technically that one works too, but actually for the sake of documentation, I just realized uh, we should go ahead and drop the position here, actually define it in here. So rather than that, it should be card.position. Okay, great. 
Yay, console warnings. Okay, so now when we refresh, uh, we should see now that when we click, hey, look at that, everything is revealing as expected. So now that we have that working, let's go ahead and commit that before moving on. We have feature, um, where so card has front and back, can be flipped. Great. All right, now that we have our cards flipping back and forth, what we really need though is to be able to track what the user has selected and then only allow them to select two cards before go ahead and flip it back. So let's go ahead and implement that. Jumping into VS Code, let's go ahead and refresh here. So what we need actually then is to track inside of our app.view the user selection, right? What, is, what have they chosen? And so what we can then what we can do is do we'll do a constant called user selection. And this will be a ref as well, because we want it to be reactive and we'll make it an array. And so what we wanted to do actually is that every time we flip a card, right, we want to actually push that payload onto the user selection. So what we're going to do here then is if user selection, and we're going to uh, say that dot value, because we need to unpack it. So if the first value exists, right, there's something inside of it, then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and assign the second value uh, basically the payload. Otherwise, by default, we will go ahead and assign the first value, the payload. Okay, so to make sure this works, we'll go ahead and expose it inside of our setup function. And then let's go ahead and use that here. So user selection. All right, so we have one click, great position value, great. Okay, so we have our cards. Um, right now, we don't have a limit, so this is this is a bug, right? Because it's just going to always infinitely, as long as we keep clicking, we'll always basically uh, replace the second value since we have we have something in the first one. That's not quite what we want, but what we do want though is the ability the ability to detect what value the card is. And while theoretically we can go through and search the cardless array, um, since we're emitting the event anyways, and we know what it is. We, there's no reason why we can't just enhance the payload uh, to include that already. One less search algorithm, right? So in this case, uh, you might be tempted to go ahead and say, okay, let's do value props that value. <clears throat> but when I'm thinking about it, actually, the problem with this is that value has is a really charged term, uh, basically meaning there's a lot of, it's like it's already in semantic HTML. And not to mention, we're unpacking values with dot values. So this means that inside our setup function, we have a lot of dot values. So it, at this time, rather than um, sort of, in order to make our code a lot, oh, sorry, easier to follow, let's rename it face value, at least at this point. Um, we won't refactor anything else, but we'll call it face value to make it very clear that this has nothing to do with the reactive value. So once we go ahead and save that, we should see now that when we refresh and we click, there we go, we see the actual face value that's actually uh, being returned. Now, what we ultimately want is to watch this user selection and see like, okay, like once it gets to two, we need to A, we need to like verify whether or not there's a match. And then if, you know, regard, and then from there, like do something with it. And so in that case, uh, what we actually need then from view is the uh, watch method. And so what this allows us to do now is that we can go, okay, so we're gonna watch our user selection array and it's going to take a callback where it's going to get the current value and the old value. But all we need right now is the current value. And so what we're saying is if current value dot length is equal to two, then we're going to set and log like, you know, uh, that's it. And otherwise, whoop, we have a quotation issue. And then once it hits, that's it. We're going to go ahead and reset user selection dot length back to zero. And then I realized we need to unpack this actually. So let's go ahead and do that. User selection dot value dot length is equal to zero. That's a way for us to clear out the, uh, basically clear out the array. So now once we say that, let's go and try that. We have one and then two. And then this is good, but nothing's happening, right? So this is kind of weird. Why? Why is this the case? 
And so if we were like, okay, let's try to like check this again. So you might might be thinking like, let's let's log current value and see why it's not working. So if we save this like once again, we may be thinking like, okay, click. Well, you'll notice that nothing's happening here in the console. And the reason for that is with an array, uh, technically there's like the values are being changed inside of it, but not like the actual, like it's not like we're swapping out like the primitives. So like we're not changing the string or the number. Arrays are a little bit more complicated. So what we need to do is actually pass um, an options property as a third argument. And where not, we say basically that we want it to uh, basically like track, watch like the deep values inside of it. So if we go ahead and save that now, you'll see that when we click, hey, this time we're actually seeing like the different one and we're actually getting our that's it property. So perfect. Um, so we can save that. Let's remove that. So this resets it. So one, two, reset. Great. So now that we have this and we're tracking like basically when it has two, we actually do need to also go ahead and update and make sure everything flips back. And so let's go ahead and do that first. So we know that uh, once we have the two cards, what we can do is we can actually go ahead and track those things. So we can say, let's see, cons, um, we'll say card one, right? This is the first one that was selected. So that's going to be current value dot value uh, zero. So that's card one and card two will be current value dot value dot one. Okay. Uh, whoops. Okay. That will be the first one. Okay. So what we're trying to say then is that inside of card list, because we're managing this with our props. Uh, inside of this list of array, we're going to go ahead and do card1.position. This is what we want to update. And we want to go ahead and update its visibility to be false. And then we'll do the same thing with card2. And we want to say visible equals false. OK. So now if we click 1, 2, oh, we got an issue. So it's saying that um, it's actually unable to find the undefined. So what's going on here? Well, let's take a look. So we have current value uh, dot value, let's see, of undefined object D. Hmm. All right. So what we can do then is let's go ahead and can I, da, da, da. let's go ahead and check our current value real quick. So let's go ahead and save this and then dun dun. so we'll do current value so we want to see what exactly is in current value right now and if we refresh we have one two and we see we have our proxies uh with one and zero great and so if we try to log current value dot value one two we'll see that's undefined and so if we go ahead and now Instead of using dot value, we go directly to the actual, um, basically what it is with a one, two. Now we'll see we actually get what it is. So um, in this case, even though even though we use a selection, typically we unpack it. At this point inside the watch, we can basically assume that when we're referring to it, it's already been unpacked. So now we can basically uncomment this, and instead of using dot value like you would expect. We can go ahead and let's take that out and there we go. All right. So now when we save, when we click inside one, two, now you can see everything is flipped over. Um, but what we need to do actually is validate whether or not the cards match correctly or not. And so what we need to do then is prior to flipping it visible, let's go ahead and run that check. So if card one dot face value, is equal to card two dot face value. Then what we're going to do is let's go ahead and create a reactive proper. Um, yes, let's create a reactive property at this time, and we'll say uh, status, and we'll make this a string. And so again, let's let's put it here. So instead of user selection this time, we're going to track the status of the card matching. And status has not been returned. That's fine. So here we go, status, great, empty block statement. That makes sense. We haven't done that yet. So then we're trying to say that status dot value is going to be equal to uh, matched. Otherwise, we're going to say status dot value equals mismatch. Okay. So here, when we click one, two, you'll see we have a mismatch. 
Great, this is exactly as they expect. After all, all of these are the same. So we can check it real quick to see if this works by updating our for loop and making all the values the same thing. So if I make them all 10 in this case, you'll see 10 here. And then when I click, hey, look, everything matched. So we have the basic logic here. But again, while this is great, we need to actually keep the things visible if it's actually matched. So let's go ahead and quickly do that. So as far as checking whether or not it's actually matched or not, we actually need to, this here of hiding it, it's only happened when we have a mismatch. So here we can save. Um, and then so here is a mismatch. Otherwise, what we actually need to do is in addition to making it visible, um, yeah, so in this case, uh, in addition to making it visible, we want some sort of indication on the card to indicate that it's checked. And so what we want to do then is go ahead and enhance our card with a matched property, basically indicating whether or not it's correct or not. So, okay, let's go ahead. So we have whether or not it's matched. So this will be a type Boolean and then we'll say uh, our default. So it will start out false, right? Only when we explicitly tell it that it's uh, matched, will it do anything different? So. In this case, again, we'll do match. Again, we'll just say false just to be consistent with passing it. So here, here is our matched. And then we can go ahead and up here, do matched as well. And this will be card.matched. Okay. And so what we want is if it is matched, we don't need to flip it back, right? So here we define, we're like, hey, it's visible. But what we do need to do is card list dot value card one dot position dot matched equals true. And we're going to do that once more with two. And so the way to verify that this is working inside of card, let's go ahead and add a property here that the value here um, and whether it's matched or not. So that's how we're going to check whether or not this is working. So here, if we click here, this is 10, this is 10 true matched, wonderful. And then we can check here and check here. Now it's true again. So awesome, we have a basic matching happening. And so now we can also check again to make sure that our other logic work. So let's go ahead and uh, inside of app.view for our for loop, which is up here. Now we're gonna go ahead and loop it back on just the index and then one, two, great, mismatch. Okay, great. Um, let's go ahead and commit this. Okay, so what we've done here, we've added a feature where we, you know, track user choice and validate uh, choices. Wonderful. Okay. All right, now that we're able to check whether or not we actually have a match or not, we need to actually add a win condition for our users. So let's go ahead and jump over into our code and let's go ahead and take a look at um, our app. And so what we ultimately want to do is inside, we want to track, how, we need to know how many remaining cards exist or maybe pairs actually to be specific that exist inside of our game. And so the way we're going to do that is let's go ahead and add a const uh, basically for remaining remaining pairs. So const remaining pairs. And so what we need this to do actually is we need this to be calculated based off a card list, right? We don't want this to be something we auto generate and some like this is something that can be based off of an existing reactive property. And so this is a perfect uh, time to use computed methods. And so computed in view basically allows us to uh, so okay, so first, we're going to import the helper method from view. And so what this does is we can call computed here and we pass it a, a, a callback function like you actually would in the data store where it's just computed, like whatever property you're defining is a method. And so the method is going to return something. So in this case, we want to actually track uh, basically the remaining cards, which is going to be the card list. And so what we can do is let's go ahead and filter it down and based on card dot matched equals false. And so this will be the remaining cards. And so once it's filtered that down, we need to actually get the actual remaining cards. And so we need to add the length. And so then we're going to go ahead and return remaining cards divided by two. 
All right, so right now it's not being used and that's that's totally fine. Um, and so let's go ahead and just see it in action. So here I'll just say remaining car, uh, pairs and then we'll just go ahead and remaining pairs like this. And then when we scroll down in our script block, you'll see now that we can go ahead and do remaining cards. Okay, oh sorry, pairs, screwed that up. Okay, so remaining pairs, here we go. So one, two, great mismatch, still eight. That's what you would expect. And so now let's go ahead and change our value to something constant. Let's pick eight this time. And so if we click one, two, hey, we have a match and our remaining pairs, as you can see, is slowly starting to count down based on the fact that it's already tracking uh, what's happening uh, inside. And so now that we have zero, at this point, we need to be like, hey, the user has one. And so we have this static react status reactive property. And so this is actually a good fit for actually, we should basically use this as a way to communicate to the user that something has happened. So we don't need the user uh, basically remaining pairs. That's something we can track, inter uh, track internally because here, what we wanna actually do then is we wanna say that inside of status, uh, let's see, do, 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 do status. So rather than just make it a plain string, we're going to do the same thing as we did before, where we're going to say, okay, so const status is going to be a computed property. And so basically what we're going to say is if remaining pairs is equal to zero, then we're going to make sure that the string uh, that we're going to return is player, win player wins. Oh my gosh, can't type. All right, great. And then otherwise, uh, we're going to say, we're gonna return remaining pairs, and then we can save remaining pairs like this. Um, and so we can save, but oh, we're gonna get an, um, an error. And the reason for that is, is that remaining pairs just like our, again, they're, they're reactive references, which means we're gonna to need to go ahead and unpack these. So let's go ahead and do that with dot value. And huzzah, okay, we have remaining pairs. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Player wins. Wonderful. Okay, this means now we have our win condition for the game. And so let's go ahead and commit that code. So we have here, everything looks great. So let's see, feature, add win condition and track remaining pairs. Wonderful, okay. Okay, now that we have the basics of our game, the, the thing is, is that we need to actually then actually make the game a little bit more interesting. Right now it's super easy, right? Everything's the same or everything's different. So what we need to do is let's go and add a shuffle method to randomize what's inside of um, our deck. Now we could certainly go through the exercise of writing our own shuffle method, but this is a great time since we're, we're trying again, we're trying to get to our MVP status as quickly as possible. Lodash is a great way for us to do this. And so what we can do is let's go ahead and add Lodash to our project. And so what Lodash is, is a utility library, basically think of it for JavaScript that implements like sort of common methods that you would, ex you know, might want to have natively, right? Like you would want an array to have a native shuffle method. But in this case, since it's not available, it's being basically updated by a, a, via a third party, um, which is widely used. And so a lot of people use Lodash, no need to worry about like it being some random library that no one's gonna support. So let's go ahead and jump in our code. So what we wanna do is let's just, we wanna implement a shuffle, shuffle method. And so in this case, we'll uh, let's see, let's, let's not do it in the middle of the computed stuff. So let's say shuffle cards. And so again, it'll be a function since it's a method. And so what we want to do is take card list.value and we want to go ahead and shuffle it. And so Lodash comes with a very convenient shuffle method. So um, this is the common syntax for indicating that it's Lodash is to use the underscore here. And so once we've imported Lodash, we can say Lodash dash, uh, sorry, dot shuffle. And what do we want to shuffle? We want to shuffle the list of cards. And so right now, like it's not being used. So let's go ahead and just see that in action. So let's shuffle the cards here. And then up in our template, we're going to add a button here and it's going to, oh, it automatically corrected. That was, that was cool. Um, at click shuffle cards and then again we'll just shuffle cards save great so now here uh, let's go ahead and show all this so that it's easy to see that it's actually being shuffled so rather than show again just a value we'll reset that to i and then we'll make all everything visible to true which is great 
And so now when we shuffle, you see that great, um, everything is randomizing correctly. And so uh, we have like sort of basic random functionality. Um, and so in addition now, now that we can shuffle it, once uh, the user has won, we need them to actually be able to uh, restart the game, right? Because right now everything in this case is visible or once they win, everything is visible. So let's go ahead and implement that feature uh, as well. So let me go ahead and commit this real quick. So we say commit feature add shuffle uh, ability, right? Okay. So now that we have that, we're going to go ahead and create a sh uh, restart game, uh, uh, basically, method. And so instead of restart game, what we're going to need to do is one, we need to actually uh, basically d map out all the cards, right? And then we need to reassign them new positions based on the shuffle. So the first thing we're going to do then is we're going to call shuffle cards. Um, basically, is what we're going to do. Uh, we're just going to call it directly here. And then once we shuffle the cards, then we're going to say card list dot value. Uh, what we need to do is actually go through and map everything just to make sure everything's hidden and that kind of thing again. So card list dot value dot map, which will return a new array. So for every card, what we're going to do is we're going to return. Um, we're going to spread out the card and we're going to update a couple things. One, we need to make sure that match is false again so that the game can track it correctly. And we need the vis whether it's visible or not to also be false. And so when we save here, we can see now that restart, oh wait, it has been assigned but never used. So let's go ahead and do that right here. Restart game, great. And then up at the top, we'll add a button now. Instead of here, we'll do restart game because now we should actually see everything happening. So restart uh, game, save, great. So when we start it, we'll see now that everything's starting to shuffle. Um, so boom, 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 seven, good. Uh, but there is a little gotcha here, and that is the fact that while we are restarting the game and we've had, uh, you know, oh, visible, uh, visible, that's why it's not hiding. That's one bug. Um, there we go. Is that when we click, you'll notice that it's doing this weird thing where it's not necessarily clicking the right area. And the reason for that is because, um, well, uh, a couple of things we have, well, one, look, we have an error here in DevTools says computed value is not being, is read only. So I think the reason for that is when we're, yeah, we're watching it. You see that we're still updating status down here. So we don't need to do that. That's its own computed property. So let's, let's wipe that out. Okay, great. Okay. Um, and so the reason though, is that the position is actually not being updated. We've actually shuffled everything, but we haven't gone through the effort of actually updating the position. And so in this case, we need to also pull out the index just like you would expect um, when you're mapping through. And then, whoa, where did I go? Okay, restart game, shuffle, great, index, uh, do, 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 there we go. And so what we also need to update in addition to matched is we need to, the position of the card is the index. So once we save, we can refresh and restart and then, oh, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. Okay. So at this point we're trying to get closer now. So, um, again, let's go ahead and switch that over to false and let's update the value again, just to be straight eight, just make sure everything's good. So we restart. Great. Great. Okay. So everything is still working as expected. So let's go ahead and commit what we've done. So as we can see, we've now implemented a restart game functionality. So let's add that. Uh, user can restart the game. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Now that we have our card flipping over and we are tracking uh, basically the user selection and validating them, what we need to do is actually make sure the deck is generated correctly. Um, so jumping into VS Code, we'll see here that we're just going through and looping through the numbers. But what we really want is to have a list of cards, right? So cons, let's say card items. And in here, we would have eight different values that are going to be generating the actual deck. So again, we'll use numbers for right now, just uh, we'll be using numbers. So we'll be using numbers right now to go ahead and just sort of demonstrate what we're doing. And then we'll sort of go from here. So for every card item, we're going to do, uh, let's do the for each loop. So for every item in this loop, we're going to want to actually push two cards to the array. 
So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to then take our card list value push here. And then for now, instead of for the position, I'm just going to set it as null for a second. And we want to push this twice. So we're going to push the item and then visible false. Yep. And then we'll go, go ahead and do it like this and we'll push it a second time. So one, two, so that pushes it twice. And so now let's go ahead and actually delete this real quick. And so now we see that we have 16 cards. And so if we go ahead and uh, check this out and make both of this true, we'll see now that we have one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, which is good. But what we need to do before we wrap up is go ahead and actually assign a position. And so the easiest way for us to do this then is to just go ahead and card list dot value um, equals card list dot value. And then this time we will go ahead and map over this, right? And so for every card and every item, we're gonna go ahead and we're going to return the an object where we spread out the card. But the one thing we need to actually, uh, oops, not item, we want index, that's the second argument. So what we really want then is update the position with index. That's what we wanna do. And so to verify that this worked correctly, let's go ahead and switch out match for uh, position. And so now we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 15, which is great. The, in, the position is correct. And then we have, however, the values now are one, one, two, two, three, three, four. So if we restart the game, uh, everything should work as expected. So this is good. Um, so now that our deck is generating properly, let's go ahead and commit that. Okay. And now that we have this, we have one more bug that we need to fix though, is that right now, if we go ahead and look at our code, um, if I go ahead and set both of, let's, let's go back to our app.view. And so if we set visible back to false, um, one of the problems we have is that when we click on two different like items, it immediately resets itself. So you're not giving the feedback back to the user as far as what that second thing is. And so the reason for that is because inside of our flip card, uh, inside of our watch selection actually right here, the moment it's two, we run the check and then immediately we basically say, uh, we either hide it or f basically um, reveal as true. So in the case that it's actually matched correctly, right, as we talked about, uh, let's see, this is five, this is seven. Okay, great. So, oh, you can, well, that's a bug. So. Um, you can match to itself twice, but here we go. So match like this. Okay. So there we go. Um, so we have a little bit of bug there, uh, but we'll, we'll fix that in a second. So right now you can see that now that we've matched these two, it permanently shows as revealed, uh, which is fine. But again, when we have two different ones, like five and this, then we have a problem. So uh, what we're going to want to do then is we actually want to give it just like a, a little bit of a timeout before we go and set the, the thing to the false. And so we, all we got to do here is wrap our set, wrap our, like basically our, our, what we're, we're hiding here. We're going to wrap it inside of the set timeout and let's just give it like, whoops. Okay. Uh, so we have that here. Great. And so we can pass it. Let's just give it uh, two seconds. And this is a millisecond, so 2000. So we know for a fact that seven and this is good, but we know that this and this is not good. And then after two seconds, it hides itself. Okay, so this is this is um, a decent workaround right now um, for just sort of allowing the user some sort of feedback. So let's go ahead and commit that real quick. So feature set timeout before. Oh, actually, this is more of a fix, right? So fix uh, allow user to see incorrect match before hiding. Okay, so now what we need to do is we need to fix that bug where when we click one card, it doesn't register twice um, and therefore like creating a match. And so again, just to replicate the bug, if we go ahead inside of card and let me show match in addition to the position, we'll see now that, uh, sorry, matched is what we want. There you go, true. So here if we click once and we click again, you'll see that it goes ahead and matches itself. That's no good. So let's go ahead and refresh and let's, let's fix that. And so what's happening here is inside of our flip card, this is where the problem is. Cause we're basically checking like, Hey, if this value is correct, what we want to do then is always assign the second one. But what we need to track 
is if they're identical. So what we're going to do then is we're going to say, so uh, if user selection dot value, if the first one is the case, um, and that's equal to payload. Uh, so actually we want to do dot. So we, we want the position and we want to check that against the payload position. And we want to go ahead and do the value of the first one. And then we want to do the face value and check that against the payload. Uh, face value. So if these things are equal, what we should see is we want it to return immediately and just basically don't do anything else because we know that like this is not that's not supposed to happen. So otherwise, go ahead and assign the second value as expected and everything else should work um, as we expect. So I realized this is wrong. This should be an and percent. Uh, with that, I think I can delete this one. Oop, what's wrong here? That's that. There we uh, see. So these two are together and these two are together. So say that. Okay, much better. So now we can see one, two. Great. True, true. Uh, because seven, seven, 13. But here, eight, 14. If we click it, nothing happens. So if we click something else, six, 11, this is a false match. And then it'll go ahead and hide again. All right. Awesome. We just fixed the bug. So let's commit that. Fix, uh, user cannot click same card, or not even just click, cannot register same card. That's what we just fixed. All right, excellent. All right, so now that we have this up and running, it's time to get to the Halloween part, the fun part of actually decorating our app so that we get that Halloween vibe. So. What we're going to do is inside of our VS code, uh, as I mentioned, um, there was this design folder that we had with all these assets. And so inside of public, we're going to go ahead and create an images uh, folder. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just actually move design into it and just rename it images. And so now we should have access to all these images inside of our, uh, of our app. So to start by styling it, let's go ahead and add, let's see, let's start with the background, right? So inside of images, we have this page background right here, page background.bg. So inside of our app div, uh, which we have here, I'm gonna go ahead and add a background your, uh, image with the URL of slash images slash, uh, actually I can use the relative to help me out here. Back, 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 public images, uh, page BG, perfect. And then now I believe I can just shorten this a little bit and then this should work. Okay, perfect. So now we have uh, this, uh, the spider web in the back, which is very nice. And so what I'm gonna need now is let me grab the background color uh, for this. Uh, where did I put it? All right, here we go. And then so, we want to go ahead and give the background color a triple zero seven zero C. And so when we save it, we have this kind of nice effect going on in here. So let me go ahead and actually uh, close this out. So, okay. So right now it's only going around the border, but that's fine. Um, there's some, a little bit of weirdness going on. So let's go ahead and delete the margin top here. And it looks like we have some HTML and body styles happening here. So let's go ahead and just margin body zero, uh, margin zero, padding zero. And then for the app itself, I just want to make sure that it has um, a height of 100 uh, viewport height. That already making it look a lot better. And looks like the only thing is, it looks like here, yeah, so we have the H1, I believe. So we inspect it. The H1 has a margin on it. So yeah, that's what's causing the final bump. So let's go ahead and actually just go ahead and drop that from it. So margin top zero. Perfect. Okay, and so that we have our background. Uh, now we can't read any of our text anymore. So let's go ahead and give it a white text. Okay, looking a little bit better now. Um, okay, so we have this. And the peak of view is bumping up a little bit to the top. So I'm going to go ahead and actually just give body um, a padding top. 
a 60 pixel. That should allow us, ooh, that's a little too much. Um, in that case, I'm just gonna add it here actually inside of app uh, because I forgot. Uh, if we do it here, there we go. And now we have a little bit more breathing room. So, all right, this is good. Um, so what else do we got? We have the cards, right? We need the cards to look a lot more fun than this. So let's go ahead and is back. Instead of background color now, we're gonna use the background image URL. And so again, let's go ahead and not in components, public images. Let's, uh, so we have a card BG here when it's empty. So let's use that. So I go ahead and now I can just use the relative URL. And what's going on? Ah, yes, syntax error. All right, um, wonderful. Uh, okay, so now we see that uh, we see the back of the card. And so let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. So the back is saved. Let's take away this border and let's give this, a, let's give the card face itself a border radius of like 10 pixels, I say. Okay, there we go. That's looking better. Um, but it looks like the cards could be just a smidge bigger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upgrade the grid here just to be a little bit larger. And so here we're just gonna go ahead and replace these with 120 pixels. And so bump it up a little bit. Hey, that's nice. And we can shrink the gap down to 24 pixels. Okay, looking good. Okay, yeah, so this is a nice surface area to play on. Um, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and refactor this real quick. So in case you didn't know, there is actually a helper function inside of grid where we can actually repeat the same values so I want to repeat it and then you basically say how many times so 100 I want to repeat that four times and so when we do it like this this makes it easier for us to refactor it in the future should we need to as you can see everything still looks good and so what we need to do now is when we flip the card we actually then want to see like we need to see the background of the, uh, the front so instead of red Similarly, we'll do the background image URL. Um, so again, let's jump back. Uh, public images, and so this will be card background. All right, so let's wait. Let's go ahead and just do the relative URL in this case. Uh, once again, I forgot here. So we flip it. Hey, look at that. We have a, basically a different color. Okay, and then what we need to do now is rather than having the checked be this, you know, it's a sort of Boolean value. We actually want to go ahead and use a check mark in the lower right. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to strip this off now. And then on the front of it, we're going to have a little, uh, we'll have a div and we'll basically say if it is uh, matched, then we'll show it. And so actually instead of div, I just realized we can just have the image directly because we know what it is. So it's the image. So the source is going to be inside of public images and we should have check mark XVG in here. Great. So actually we, don't, we can do a self closing tag. So I go ahead and put this back. Um, we can see now, Hey, okay. So we have our check mark here. And so match though, we need this to actually be positioned correctly. So let's go ahead and just uh, we'll call it icon check mark for the class check mark all right and so in here if we do icon check mark i'll do position absolute so that we can position it in the right and on the bottom so if i save that that looks pretty good but i want to bump that out just a little bit so let's replace this with 10 pixels uh maybe a little less let's do five okay so now we can see that if it's not the correct one. It's going to go ahead and hide itself, but otherwise uh, we basically are good to go. And then it's going to go ahead and stay match. So five, eight, nope. Uh, and then six, four, nope. Uh, three, oh, there you go, three, five. And you see, uh, hey, look at that, our check mark up here. So, okay, already looking much better. Now, uh, again, since this Halloween, we have, as you can see, all these really fun images on the left that we want to use. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is let's update. Uh, so let's take away the position. We don't need this anymore. So for the value then, actually what we're gonna do, this is actually a great time for us to go ahead and define what is in. So we'll, in this case, let's uh, give it a name. Uh, actually name is pretty charged too. 
So let's do, okay, let's just go back to our face. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, take that back. So for now, again, let's just go ahead and do string. And then inside of the string, what we expect is to see that here. So when we go back inside of our app.view, we can see here now that we have items. And so in here, I wanna go ahead and register some of these fun things that we have. So we have like that, we have candy, we have cauldron, we have cupcake, we have ghost and moon, and we have the pumpkin, and we have the witch hat. So if we go ahead and save, whoops. Okay. So if we save that now, we should see that witch has and ghosts uh, basically are looking good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what we want to do though is render these images. So what we'll do then is images source. And so we're going to go again, go inside of public images. And then this time we're going to say, then we have the value in here dot PNG. So wrap that in the back ticks. And then we can go ahead and bind the alt also to value. Uh, here we go. And then if we save, uh, right, got to ship away the public, the relative path, non-relative. And look at that. We have our images showing up, um, but it's a little off center. So let's go ahead and fix that real quick. Um, because when we're on the card phase, we can go ahead and assume we really want everything to be justified center. So we can use Flexbox to easily achieve that. And so that jumps us right back into the middle. So you see, hey, look at that. We have our uh, images now. So we can click and we have this. Oh, that's the cupcake. Ah, the ghosts are here. And then here, what's in here? Moon, awesome. Hat, cupcake. But it looks like everything's actually in order right now. So we actually need to, if we restart the game now, we should see that, there you go. Now they're no longer side by side. Um, but okay, so we'll, uh, we got a couple more things to skin. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and update the page title real quick before we commit all these fun styles we have for our app. So instead of the peak of view here, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do an image here with the source. Again, let's jump back into, whoop, this is too far. So we have public uh, images, this is a peak of view title, great. And so it'll be peak of view. Okay. And then I'm gonna go still add an H1 here for peak of view just for uh, content purposes, but we're going to add a screen reader only for this class just for uh, accessibility purposes. Um, there's a lot more accessibility things we honestly should be doing um, if we were to, like build this fully out. But for now, um, I believe I have an X. Yep, here we go. So we save that. Boom. Wonderful. So if I go ahead and add this, uh, I'll give this a class of title can go ahead and bump this a little bit. Padding bottom, let's do 30 pixels. Okay, this is looking really good. And finally, the restart button game could use a little bit of love. So let's go ahead and give that a class of button. And I actually have a little icon for us to use. So we'll do the image source. Um, let's make sure we do this correctly. So again, public images restart SVG, perfect. And then we will go ahead and give it an alt of restart icon, delete the relative path, save. All right, already looking better. And so let's space that out a little bit and then We'll need to update our class button. So let's do that real quick. So button will have a background color of orange and color white. Let's see, padding, let's give it one rem. Let's see how that does. That's a little too much. 
maybe bump it down on the sides a little bit, maybe top is a little too much. And then we are not aligned right now. So let's do display flex, align item center. Uh, and again, let's justify the content to be center as well. Okay, better. Uh, but oddly enough, it's jumping over to the side. I wonder if I need to margin zero auto it. Okay, there we go. And so the only thing we need to do now is the button for the image. Let's just give it a padding right of 10 pixels. Uh, too much. Okay, and then I would like the font weight to be bold. All right. Okay, very cool. All right, so we're, we're just about done. We've skinned the game so that we have images that will go ahead. Um, but there's some a couple final touches let's do. But let's go ahead and commit this code. We've done a, quite a bit in this. So we'll add all of this. And we'll say feature add Halloween styles. Great. All right, so now that we have our cool Halloween styles showing up on the page, it'd be nice to add a little bit of animation to make this game just a bit more fun. And so we talked about this being a card flipping game, so it'd be great for us to add a card flipping animation to it. And so we're gonna go ahead and build that out by hand. Um, so jumping into our code editor, we have right now inside of a card.view, we have styles here uh, for the various cards, but what we need is actually, we're gonna use CSS to animate it and flip it. And so what we need is a dynamic CSS class that will basically allow us to toggle whether or not to flip or not to flip. And so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna create a computed property called flip styles. And so this is gonna actually uh, be a computed property that we'll, we'll, we will we'll sort of generate based on whether it's visible or not. So let's go ahead and import that from view real quick. Import, whoops. Okay, so I'm gonna import computed from view. And then in here, we're gonna say basically if props.visible, so if it's visible, then we're gonna say uh, is flip is a CSS class that we want to define. And so we haven't exposed it yet, which makes sense. So we're gonna expose it here. And then we're gonna use it inside of here as a vbind dynamic class. And we'll do, uh, I believe it's flip styles, I called it. I don't know why it's not auto completing, but that's fine. Okay, and so to make sure this is working, let's check our dev tools real quick. So if I click on this, you'll see, hey, it's flipped. And then if I click here, it's flipped. And then when it's visible, boom, it's gone. And that's great. Um, that's exactly what, that's, that's what we want. So what we need to do now is actually define the flip styles. So let's start by going into our card and saying, okay, so if card is flip, what is actually happening? So from an animation perspective, we're rotating it along the Y axis. So we're gonna use the transform CSS property and do rotate along the Y and we're gonna rotate it 180 degrees. That's what we ultimately wanted to do. And to make sure that it's animating, we do need to apply the transition uh, property on whatever it is we're actually um, animating. So in this case is the dot card. And so I'll give it half a second and then we'll at what prop we want to animate the transform property and we'll give it an ease in in this case. So I go ahead and say that. We'll see that when we click, hey, it looks like it's it's flipping correctly, except it's acting a little funny. Uh, why is that? Um, so number one, we're seeing this blinking effect. And so if you actually think about it, this actually makes sense. This is not something CSS. Uh, we're doing this actually because view, we've defined the vif directive here. And that means that guess what? Um, it's actually destroying the element and then recreating it every single time. So it's no wonder why we're seeing that blinking effect. And so since we're managing everything with CSS animations now, we can go ahead and save that and we're good. So click here. Okay, so better now, we're seeing the full flip, but noticing that this is a little weird, we're not seeing the back anymore. Uh, in fact, we're not seeing the front. And part of it is because if you think of the individual card frames, like the card front and the card back, they're basically taking over both planes of visibility. And so what we wanna go ahead and do in this case is we want the, the back face to actually be hidden. We don't want it to show up. So back face visibility is actually part of it and we need it to be, I believe I'm just say hidden here. And so now if we click on this, you'll see, okay, so not totally working yet. And that's because here's the other thing too, is that right now our 
our uh, back face is currently like we we have both planes facing the same way. Um, and so we hit the back of the front and then we hit the back of the back, but they're facing the same way. So we technically can't see anything. So what this means is we actually need to flip the or rotate for that matter, the the back of the card also by 180 degrees. And so here we have it. So now if we click um, it's oh wait, sorry, I have the wrong one, not the, the back but the front, because the, the front is actually what's face down. That's what we have to remember. Whatever's face down, we need to rotate it. So now when we click on it, this should be a little bit, oh, okay. So it's still a bit hidden. And so the reason for that is I forgot. The other thing we need here is on our transform is to actually preserve the 3D, because we wanted like the entire time as it's going through, we needed to preserve the 3D effect. So now if we go ahead and flip, hey, look at that we have our animating cards as they're flipping in and out. So with that, let's go ahead and save that work real quick. Feature add flip animation. Awesome. Now that we have our cards flipping, what we also want to do is give users feedback when the cards are actually shuffling. So let's jump back into VS Code. And so here we have, uh, let's see, so we have here all of these cards here are basically, um, we know that they're uh, basically they're lined up and we need to animate them and sort of move them. And so typically this might be a pretty complicated thing to do um, if you're not familiar with animation because this means you have to track everything, you have to move like figure out where to move it. But in case you didn't know, Vue has an element that's, super, that's built into the framework which is super useful called transition group. And so what transition group allows us to do is basically say that, hey, everything within this tag, right? So in this case, it was originally a section, so we're giving it a tag section. Um, we're gonna give it an animation and we're gonna track it with, and so in this case, I'm gonna call it shuffle card. And so what it's gonna do is gonna apply this animation here, uh, basically like to the individual pieces and, and track everything. So we won't go into like how it's implemented, but that's kind of high level. So if we go down into our CSS, um, let's go ahead and add this at the bottom. So we named the card, uh, sorry, we named the animation shuffle card. And so what we're going to do, we want them to move. Uh, and so this is why we're going to add the, the append the dash move. And so this is something that's built into the animation API. So this is um, something you can certainly check out in the docs. And so what we want to do is we want to transition the transform step. And so I'll give it a 0.8 second and I'll go ahead and do um, an ease in like this. Okay, so that's what it's going to do. So now, if we go ahead and take a look at our cards here, we're gonna go ahead and restart. And again, we're not, we're not really seeing anything change. And so the way for us to check this is to actually go ahead and, uh, let's see, so we have our card index here. Um, inside of card, let's go ahead and print out the position of the card on the back. So inside of our template, I'm gonna print this here position and then to make sure we see it correctly because it's barely visible let's just add a quick style of color black font size to run all right wonderful so when we click restart game what we should be seeing is everything shuffling and so if we take a look at restart game you'll see that it's trying to call this shuffle method but nothing is actually happening. And then, uh, so part of looks at what, what's ended up happening is uh, shuffle cards is sort of in, like calling this, uh, this like the assignment separately, but we're, we're gonna go ahead and just uh, remove that optimization. And so now shuffle cards not defined, that's totally fine. We can delete shuffle cards now from being exposed. Okay. And then here we go. So now we here, uh, is anything happening? Let's go ahead and check. Uh, so restart game. So if we go back here. Uh, so that's when you click, it's going to restart. So we're going to shuffle it and then we're going to map it. And so again, let's go ahead and make this true. So yeah, we shuffle. Great. So here, everything looks good. And then we shuffle again. All right. So things are moving, but Things are moving, but why isn't anything animating? That's really the question here. And so when you're animating between things, it's really important that you have basically a unique key that tracks each individual card. And the thing is right now is our key is actually just defined as the card and index. 
which means that this is actually getting reassigned every single time that uh, basically we're remapping or re, re like sort of reorganizing the array. This this key is always being changed. And so what we actually need is to track the value and we need to basically have like this unique thing that's consistent. And so what we're going to actually need to do now is that inside of our looping, right, we're pushing things. In addition to pushing the value, we're actually going to tell it which variant it is. And so this is a way to distinguish uh, between the two. So the value and the variant, and this two will give sort of like basically our consistent key that we're looking for. And so here, instead of just index, we're actually going to go ahead and uh, do card dot value, and then we're going to add the card dot variant. And so this here that we don't no longer need index. And so now when we save and we click shuffle, you'll see, hey, look at that, everything is moving. Um, it has like a little cool flip effect, but the reason for that is because, well, I had remapped it to true, but we can go ahead and put that back to false. And so now you'll see that it, even though the position itself you can see is updating, because the key is unique and is being kept consistent as the list is moving, everything is moving around as expected. So let's go ahead and remove that background position now from the back. We no longer need it. Um, we know that it's working as expected, which is great. And so again, we can reshuffle and look, we, we're seeing it shuffle. So exciting. All right, so let's go ahead and commit that feature. So feature, um, shuffle, card, animation. So now that we have these animations going, it'd be great to add just a little bit more of a celebration once the user wins. Because right now, um, if we look in our code under status, uh, under app.view, so if we look for our status, uh, what we'll see here is that all we're doing is simply saying player wins, which is fun, but given that we're taking a little bit more of an exciting route with the animations, it'd be great if we had like confetti pop, right? And so, you know, don't worry, we're not gonna build this from scratch. Um, this is where third party libraries are super helpful. So um, the one that we're gonna use today is called Canvas Confetti, uh, which I really enjoy sort of the usage of. And so what we're gonna do is go ahead and add this inside of our app. And so while that's adding, we're going to go ahead and check it out uh, over here. And so what you can see here is that on the demo site, he, they, or the author provides um, different ways for us to see kind of what it looks like. So this is a random direction, here's a realistic look. And so this is great. Um, the one I'd like us to play around with is actually School Pride. And so here is the code snippet. So we're going to go ahead and copy this. Uh, and so now while right now we've been basically trying to keep everything in setup, since this is basically a third party function, let's go ahead and create a utilities function um, at the moment. And so in this one, we'll say Okay. So since this is a third party library, what we want to do is actually go ahead and separate out the JavaScript just to make it a, just a little bit easier to manage. So in this case, I'll put it in a utilities folder and then we'll call it uh, basically confetti.js. That's what we want to use. So we'll import confetti from canvas. Uh, well, I have the fine, there you go. Okay, from canvas confetti. And so then we're basically going to paste this, but um, not just pasting it actually. So this is, we're going to export a cons, uh, which is a function uh, called uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, we're just going to call it confetti in this case. Uh, do, do. Actually, sorry, launch confetti is really what we want to do, right? That's the function. And it will run this piece in here. So just for sake of keeping everything with ES5 and or ES6 and above, we're going to save that. Okay, looks good. And so inside our app.view, what we can do now is we're gonna import. So we have that from here. We're going to import from our utility functions, okay, confetti. And so we should get a method called launch confetti. So this is where we're gonna store that code. And so what we want is when the basically remaining pairs of value is zero, we wanted to go ahead and fire our uh, confetti. 
And so what we're basically doing is we're doing a watch just like before. So if you scroll down, currently we're watching user selection, but what we're going to do is we're going to add a second watch and we're going to go ahead and watch the uh, remaining pairs. And so it's going to take the current value uh, of remaining pairs. And so we're going to say if current value is equal to zero, so the, what's left, we're going to do launch confetti and run that. So let's go ahead and see how, how that works. So if we go ahead and refresh the page, go ahead and reveal. So check six, five, four, three, two, and one. And hey, look at that. We have our awesome schoolyard, uh, our school pride confetti. And since we are building this with Vue, I thought it'd be go uh, fun if we went ahead and got the Vue logo colors for our confetti. So let's do Vue logo colors. And so here we go. Let's go into our confetti utility right here. And we'll drop in the police blue and we'll drop mint. All right. And so when we save this uh, and let's go ahead and refresh, we can go ahead and quickly jump through because we know exactly where the cards are in this case. And wow. yay, we have our view confetti being shot across our uh, game when the user wins. And so now when we click restart, everything starts over. And so it looks like the animation is going a little bit longer than probably desired. So I'm just going to cut that down by a third um, and just take that to 10. Um, so with that, we have our uh, confetti. So let's go ahead and commit that code. So we have feature at confetti to win condition, which is great. Now that we have the animations we need for the game, let's go ahead and tighten up the home page uh, finally to basically give the users a little bit more of a hint as to what they can expect when they're playing the game. And so the first thing we want to do is go ahead and actually reveal some of the cards so that basically users know there is a front and a back. And so the way we're going to do that is inside of our app.view, when we're actually setting the cards, we're going to go ahead and set uh, basically one half of it to, uh, to be true. And so, oh, OK, great. So now at least we can see the different icons and everything's looking better. Uh, so this is good. Uh, what we also need though is a little bit of a description for the game. So we're gonna drop that up here underneath the image. And so this is a section. And then, so again, we're gonna say, welcome to peak of view. And then uh, let's see, a card matching game powered by Vue.js. Uh, three. All right. So when we take a look, okay, this is looking pretty good. Uh, styles could use a little bit of work though. So we'll go ahead and add a description to this section. And so down here, we're going to go ahead and inside of our CSS, we'll have dot description. And then what we're going to do is we need to actually update the typography across this, uh, just to standardize it a bit more. So let's go ahead and go to Google font. And then I'm going to use the Tilium web for this page and let's go with semi bold and let's embed it. So I'm going to go ahead and drop this inside of our index.html since that's where we would be uh, typically expect to uh, import it. So we'll drop it right here. And then we will need this font family to specify uh, what it looks like. So in here, at least we can say font family to Tilium web. You can see, okay, already looking better. And so we want uh, basically all the P tags inside of there to have margin zero, at least for the moment. Let me see how that looks. Okay, I'm okay with this for the most part. Uh, the only thing that is the last child, what we want to do is just give that a, a bit more padding. So in this case, I'm gonna say margin bottom, let's see, 30 pixels. Um, okay, yep, this is looking better, okay. So here we are already starting to see this. And then let's go ahead and match the remaining bottom as well. So here we have the button. Um, if we look at our index uh, error HTML, we have our H2 status. So again, I'm just gonna do that a class of status. So we have our status and our button and both of them also need the Tetillium web. So let's go ahead. So a button here, uh, font family, great. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and add status here. 
And then if we refresh, uh, things are looking good. Um, and so it looks like the button might need a bit thicker of a weight. And then more importantly, it looks like the font size might be a little small. There we go. Uh, this is a little bit better. 1.1. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and strip away the border uh, in this case. So border zero, but border radius. Uh, let's give that five pixels. And then if we save, let's uh, not too bad. Maybe 10 would be better. Yeah, I like 10 better. And then it looks like the sides though could use a little bit more padding. Actually, it's interesting. It looks like the sides could use more padding than the top and bottom. Okay, that's looking better. I'm, I'm happy with that. And so we have remaining pairs here. Uh, looks like description also actually is a little bit small. So let's bump that up. Uh, description, oh, sorry, not just that, all of them. Okay, great. Okay, so we have this. This sort of gives people what they want to do. Um, the only thing that's a little bit weird about this is that it says restart game, uh, basically before we even get started. And so technically you need to start the game. And so what we're gonna do to keep, make this simple to keep track of is inside of our setup block, we're gonna go ahead and add another ref. And this time we'll say new player. And so at the beginning, this is always true. So basically new player is ref true. And we know that we're going to want to update this. So I'm going to create, um, again, just for sake of watching me code here, we'll have a start game function. And all it's going to be responsible for doing is taking new player.value and assigning it false. So um, now we need to go ahead and expose that down here. One more. And so we have a start game method. Jumping all the way back up. We now have this start game, but really what we want to do then is there's a restart game and then there's really a start game button. And so we have a play SVG in our design icon. So I'm going to say start game like this. And so we should see both of our buttons here. Okay. Looking good. And the main thing here though, is that if it's a new game, then a new player, then we want to show this. Uh, otherwise, we're going to show the other one. Okay. And so new player, wait, new player should be true. Yeah. So if we refresh, oh, right. I never exposed new player. So let's jump down into our return. And so new player is like this. There we go. Now we have start game. And when we click, great, restart. Uh, the only thing though is that once we start the game, we want to hide it and then shuffle it. So similar to restart game, actually, it's actually very similar. Uh, we have to basically run this all over again. And so what we can do, let's give this a shot, is we know that here, so we can do restart game and, and run it here. So if we check here and click it, you'll see everything now works as expected. Great. So now we can... Um, yeah, so naming wise, this could actually be uh, improved. But our goal here is now we've managed to start. Um, so here we have our start game. And then uh, once we get down, we can restart. And everything flips. All right, so let's go ahead and commit that. And then we'll say uh, feature uh, tweaks to home page experience. All right. Now that we have everything built, it's time for us to deploy. I'm going to be using Netlify to deploy our application so that other people can play with our game. So inside of my Netlify, um, I'm going to go ahead and click on new site from Git. And we're going to go to GitHub. And I'm going to find my peak of view repository. Currently private, but don't worry, it will be public by the time this video is published. And so as far as the build settings, we're going to run build and then the pub the publish directory will be dist. And so this is like the default that we have uh, with view apps. And so now we can see that the site deploy is in progress. So we'll go ahead and check that out. 
And so we can see uh, basically it's downloading the dependencies and running that. Um, while it's doing that, I do want to make a quick comment that while you know we've built a lot of different features, one of the things that we might have you might have noticed inside of our setup function is that it's got a lot going on, and it's actually kind of hard to figure out what's what and where the responsibilities are. You know, at what point are we just simply doing like deck functionalities, and at what point are we lo looking at game functionalities versus you know and, and card functionalities? And so because of that, um, again. As we can see, we've done a lot in the time we've had today, but we we're going to spend another uh, episode basically dedicated to talking about how we can best sort of refactor this code so that it's easier to maintain and, for frankly, for future developers to better understand. So be sure to keep an eye out for that next week. All right, so it looks like the build is going through and our site is live. So if we go ahead and preview it, you can see now that our game is up. So it's we can go ahead and check and see if everything works. So here's the bat. Hey, okay, now we have our check. Uh, so let's go ahead and then ghost moon. Okay, so the ghost is here. Ooh, ghost is here. So a little bit of animation delay. And Aldrin's here. Great candy. Not quite pumpkin. Cupcake. Okay, so we got cupcake. We have our uh, pumpkin candy. And all right, everything works exactly as we expect. Wonderful. So uh, just to wrap up, um, we have now our site deployed. Um, but it would be nice for us to actually go ahead and set the site name to something a little bit easier for us to remember. So we will do peakaview.netlify.app. And then with that, we now have our site at peakaview.netlify.app. And with that, we're done. I hope you've enjoyed watching as we've built Peakaview together. And if you're looking for the source code and want to check out how everything works, I'll be sure to include the repo inside of the description. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Ben Code Zen, signing off.